G'day fans and welcome to another exciting episode of Rip It Off The Card. Now, believe it or not, this is episode 10. We finally made it to double figures. How good is that? Now, the question will be, will we ever make it to not just triple figures, but quadruple or quintuple figures? Oh, how exciting would that be, eh? A thousand weeks worth of uh, of this show. And I tell you what, you'd be doing very, very well. Mr. Aaron, how are you going tonight, old son? Star Wars didn't even make it to episode 10. <laughs> I'm going really well. <laughs> How's everyone out there? I uh, absolutely love that. Well, I mean, yeah, it's very funny because it gets very confusing when it comes to counting Star Wars movies because people always like to say, well, there's like what, 9, 10, 11 films, but then do you count the Ewok movies? And, you know, some people even want to stick in the uh, holiday special. and uh, You just don't do that. It's just it gets out of well, control the, and it gets messy. The, the X-Files movie started at number 10 if you're going Roman numerals. <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. I love that. We've got 11 people watching us at the moment. Uh, g'day to good old Greg and William, uh, Joshua, Rob, who I met at uh, Aaron's store on uh, Saturday, who's a bit of a spanking fan, if you know what I mean, from the past couple of episodes. Let's not get into those details, shall we? And good old Collins, good to see you. Claire's joining us. So we've, as always, got a very, very special night tonight. We're covering a lot of really, really cool stuff. So cool, in fact, we shouldn't muck around. We should just get straight into it. What do you reckon there, Mr. Aaron? I think it sounds good. Very cool. All right. As always, we kick off with a little bit of news. Oh, hang on. Look at Colin has already said he's had to. He's going to have to watch this later. So he's just joined us and he's just going to bail out and watch the replay. Oh, at least stick around for the eBay stuff, which is always very, very cool. All right, let's move on to it. Very, very cool stuff. Go for it. Okay. The most exciting news this week, and it might not seem like toy news, but it is, is the first pictures for the new He-Man animated series that's going to drop on Netflix later in the year have just dropped. This is the Kevin Smith series. That was Mothman. Here's Skeletor. And of course, it's toy news because the whole cartoon was inspired originally to be a giant toy ad to make kids buy um, He-Man figures. So this is um, the first images that have been released. We're looking at now. Um, and I think it looks quite good. What do you think, Dags, compared to the original? Well, it's very funny because even in the store, people come in and they ask me Master of the Universe questions and Transformers and all the rest of it. And I'll be frankly honest, I'm not really au fait with those um, shows and the toy lines. And I couldn't work out why. It's like, why is it that I don't know about this stuff? I heard of it. Why didn't I even watch this show when it first came out? And then I twigged. It came out all in the late 80s. And by then I was driving cars and I was going to parties and I was dating girls. And so <laughs> cartoons and toys just weren't floating my boat at that point. So I've got to say... Uh, this is a chance for me to catch up and sort of say, okay, I haven't watched any of the previous stuff, but I'll certainly give this a go. And I have to concede, I reckon the images are fantastic. They really do look really quite good. I think they're looking really good too, and it'll be interesting to see if these sell as many toys as the original. Of course, the original, the toys were based at kids. Of course, now the toys are based at adults. So the same people who watched it back in the 80s will be watching it again now and going down to, to Maya going, gimme, 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 gimme. And um, picking up their new hit of He-Man plastic. Mate, they won't be going to Maya. They'll be going to your store. And they'll be going, mate, gimme, 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 gimme. <laughs> you know what the funny thing will be is if they produce all these action figures and all these toys and all these kids, as you said, go gimme, gimme, gimme. But because they're marketed at adults, all the prices are like 600 bucks, 700 bucks, 800 bucks. <laughs> So, yeah, <laughs> that is well. By the time you add postage in, a hundred bucks a figure isn't something that's out of the realms for new figures at the moment, is it? Uh, if they're not released locally, then that's what everyone will probably be looking at. Yep, yeah, I totally agree. And I would not be surprised if they've actually done this intentionally and said, okay, the kids might want this stuff, but it's the adults who have the money, and therefore you market it to the adults. But I'm very cu curious to see how the show goes, and uh, and I'll certainly be watching it. Just uh, so when people come to the store and ask me, where are all these characters? I don't just look at them blankly and go, I don't freaking know. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's actually very, very cool. All right, so Master of the Universe we have. And the next exciting thing, of course, is this. It's not just Spotlight and people just doing, like, sewing shit. They're actually showing something important shit what is it yeah, rip it off the card now sponsored by lincraft um <laughs> no this is some uh sneak peeks that the NECA toy company have released of their new child's play range i think this is really interesting actually because usually you see the figures completed but they're actually showing some of the fabric swatches and the different colors and the different techniques they use uh these are for their life-size one-to-one scale Chucky, and do you know who the female Chucky was, Dags? Do you remember yeah, 10 points? Uh, Mrs. Chucky, uh, Chuckalina. <laughs> it was, it was, Chuck, Chuck, it was oh Tiffany. Um, so these are the, the, the new one-to-one -one scale figures that Hang are on. coming out. They haven't released full pictures of them yet. These are teaser pictures. 
Hang on, did you say her name was Tiffany? Yes. So does she like eat breakfast a lot? <laughs> yeah. So, so we've got a response. I love it. <laughs> uh, I'm just shaking my head. Dad jokes already. It's it's only five minutes into the show. But yeah, so um, that's, a, that's yeah. an ordinary headphone rip off if ever there was one. I imagine she looked like this in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> I do I do like how they've gone straight away for the distressed, cut-up-looking Chucky, which means that um, if there's any issues in the production line with rips and tears and stuff like that, the quality control doesn't have to be as strict because it just looks like it's part of the actual um, piece they're making. In fact, the more ripped up it is, the more custom and the, the, the cooler it actually looks. Yeah, so that's, um, that's the new Chucky doll. He's obviously not straight out of the factory. He looks like he's been um, running around having a murder spree, and this is what we're getting uh, a little bit later in the year. So anyone who's into the horror toys, a one-to-one -one scale, Chucky and Tiffany, um, could be a good, good thing to pick up. I wouldn't be surprised if there's budget cuts at the Transport Accident Commission. They say we need to reproduce a child being injured in a car crash, and they just borrow this without even changing any of it and just stick it straight, straight in the head. So it's a uh, yes, yeah, a tad, uh, it's a tad uh, extreme, isn't it? But uh, I mean, I actually love these big blown up photos. Like you just look at that. Use that as a screensaver at work. Uh, anybody, anybody out there, you'll uh, be a, that's what you call a career limiting move if ever there was one. So very, very cool. All right, so from Chucky and. Who'd you say it was? Uh, oh, shit. Tiffany. Um, there you go. We move on to, oh, bloody Star Wars. Jesus Christ, you can't get enough of it. So I think um, everyone will be saying, well, Boba Fett's going uh, very gay pride, but this is actually the retro prototype versions. And for people who collect Frodo prototypes, I was going to say prototypes for some reason. For people who collect prototypes, they'll know that when they press out the original hard copies, um, they just use any plastic that's around because they're not going to be released. So occasionally a really cool prototype will turn up and it's like rainbow colours or totally different from the final piece. And toy companies have realised that people actually really like that so they've actually pressed their own prototypes which aren't prototypes but they're replica prototypes i guess now this is old news because these came out um about a year ago in the states and sold out instantly and now changing hands on the secondary market for you know 100 plus dollars each except if you're in australia where they've just gone up on pre-order at the pop culture website for $29 each. So this is an investment alert. If you're looking for something that you're kind of guaranteed to um, go up in value, they're already sold out worldwide. And this is um, the Australian stocks finally hitting the, the shores here. And Boba Fett, the Mandalorian is always something that's really sought after. So if you are a Boba Fett fan, that's one to look out for. Yeah, I personally think it's complete trite myself, but each their own. Uh, <laughs> all right, so a couple of things i got to report. Uh, yeah, sorry, Thomas, that's probably my fault. I speak so loudly that the sound comes out at Aaron Speaks at the other end and his microphone then picks it up. So, uh, yeah, that's probably me just getting a bit excited, but uh, it kind of happens, yes, yeah, so as William said the same thing. So uh, we choose not to wear uh, earpieces in the show because, uh, you know, just because we, can't, we can't be fagged. And you're right, Claire, Tiffany's was actually a place, not the person. So, but, you know, it worked for the joke. So, and it was all I could think of at the time because I didn't know who bloody Chucky's sister was or the they girl. Should, they should do a... Um, they should do a child's play sequel and call it massacre at tiffany's and set it in the in the <laughs> tiffany <laughs> uh love it very good uh colin's also said he's put his order in for his razor crest that we still saw last week uh and just don't tell the wife because if the wife gets it she'll smash it up and it'll be still be screen accurate so it's all <laughs> no problems there and at the, all, so. the wife will actually blame me for alerting everyone we have a sign up in the store it's kind of a riff on the alien um uh like uh catchphrase in store, no wife can hear you spend. Um, Love so. it. Absolutely fantastic. So that's the news for this week, which is kind of cool. And, yeah, that Boba Fett thing, I was just going to say, the multicolored and all that, it's like, yeah, that's just that's a complete wank in my personal opinion. And and you're right, maybe down the track it might have some value, may this, may that. You know, I think it's just a massive cash in. Um, so that yeah. one you'd be tempted to rip off the card. Uh, or not buy it all, so uh, that'd be my style. So there you go. <laughs> anyway, we're going to move into the exciting part of the show. We've got 16 people watching us at the moment, and they are hankering out for this particular bit, so uh, which is very, very cool. And, of course, it is our eBay section. And tonight, what are we talking about, Mr. Aaron? 
we're talking about fabulous apparel. So if you're a collector of vintage T-shirts or new T-shirts or even screen-used items, this is the episode of Rip It Off The Card where your knowledge will shine. I tell you what, I got a, one of our regular viewers. I don't think he's on at the moment. Jeffro, uh, he had a huge T-shirt collection back in the day, and then he wanted to offload at a, uh, a collector's fair, and of course he puts them all out for sale, and they're all fantastic. But of course he didn't wash any of them, and they all have the sweat stains under the armpits. So, what a freaking idiot! Um, so, if you're not used to this uh, segment before, these items are all been sold. We want you to guess what you think they went for. So, uh, what have we got uh, for this particular uh, item, uh, Mr. Aaron? We're starting it off with a vintage Akira T-shirt from the uh, the old. Uh, well, it's been made remade a couple of times, but the the original Akira uh, movie from 1991. So this would have probably been very niche at the time when it came out. It's probably got more of a following now. So T-shirts might have been hard to find. I think I remember these in Minotaur back in the day, though. All right, so start putting your answers in, everybody, as to what you think this went for. Dave has said, and I missed this, sorry, Dave, uh, the Chucky doll was repurposed in the Crypt Keeper in Tales from the Crypt, same blue eyes. Oh, there you go. Don't make your brown eyes blue. So there you go. I actually like Akira. I'm not really into anime, but I actually must admit I did find the film quite good. I saw it at the Astro, oh, no, the Valhalla once upon a time. So, uh, but yeah, 1991 for a bit of Akira fans. All right, so what do we got? All right, the numbers are coming in. Ange has gone for 500 bucks. It's a T-shirt, Ange, for crying out loud. Colin's gone for 100. Uh, Thomas is at 150. Joshua's at 50. Uh, They're going down. Greg, Greg King doesn't let me down on the close rack. Two bucks at the grind sale. <laughs> that is awesome. Ah, I tell you what, very, very cool. Um, the Vile has gone for 300. Quat loot. I don't know what that is. Uh, Rob has gone for 250. A lot of money for this Akira shirt. You guys will obviously think there's a bit of baby. So, and there are the 20 kids. Put up items that maybe might be worth something. Sorry, I cut you off. What was the first bit you said? Uh, they're catching on to the fact that we're putting up items that might be worth something. Oh, yeah, very good. And there were 20 bids, and I can't imagine these bids are like $1 increments. So uh, there you go. Uh, William's also gone for 250 as well. Uh, yeah, you do sort of wonder, don't you, when there's a lot of bids, it's like, yeah, and pre-owned, that could mean like a person wore it once or they used it to, to buff the car after they gave it a wash. So uh, there you go. Used, All right, so used, used but in good condition is like internet talk for if you smell the armpits, it'll chloroform you. Yeah, I tell you what, if you wear Jeffro shirts, because they were white shirts, so the stains were yellow. It was just, oh, it wasn't good at all. And James has gone for 85. You slipped that one in quite nicely. Oh, okay. So your Quadros is Star Trek betting money. Yeah, right. It's getting a bit too complicated for my liking. All right, vintage 1991 Akira T-shirt used, but in good condition. Interpret that any way you want. And the price went for 350 and one cent, $355 and one cent. And I tell oh, you what, not. the guy that bid $355 is spewing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly right. Uh, I think the vial actually has is a 300 some bullshit bloody currency that doesn't exist in the world. Um, and I'm just seeing if anybody else. <laughs> That's good. I've got a question I've got to answer in a second. Hang on, just give me a tick. Uh, yeah, I think the vial got this one, which is uh, very, very good, even though he's using uh, money that doesn't exist. How many shirts are these do I own? I own shitloads. I went out to the shops and I said, give me 365 of them, one for every day of the year, which is absolutely fantastic. And remember, it's not the shirt, not it's the body that's in noticed, it. But I'm, I noticed before the show, every week, Dags appears naked from the neck up. <laughs> very, very good. So there we go. All good stuff. All right, let's move on to the next item. Here we go. Well, this one, this one's got to be cheaper, isn't it? It's a Disney Toy Story T-shirt. Um, it's a large, it's a original Toy Story from Toy Story One. It's a, it's got Pixar tags on it. It's got Pixar on it, so it's probably going to be worth a fortune because you know Pixar means um, folding stuff, doesn't it, when it comes to releasing movies? But there's a lot of people that collect Toy Story merchandise. It's one of those things people maybe don't realise how many collectors there are. And if you were a kid and you watched Toy Story back in the day, you're an adult now that might have some disposable income, and you might be spending some of it on this not only that as always there were 16 bids for this one as well and i can tell just by looking at the shirt i don't know how well it, uh, the res is on uh, your image uh, at uh, at home kids but there was actually writing on the back as toy story as well so it's actually got printing on the other side all right so Ange just said 500 for this which is groovy and uh colin's gone for the cheap ass op option of 150 josh was in the middle of 350 
Uh, okay, James says the wife has said 115. If the wife gets it, that's actually going to be very, very impressive. So what do you reckon, James? Do you reckon she's on the ball or do you reckon she's way off target? So there you go. So uh, I don't know about you. When I look at this T-shirt, I get a, a Woody. <laughs> I'm going to stop right there. <laughs> anyway, so uh, it's such a dodgy name. You have uh, Woody, isn't it, when you sit and think about it? Um, Thomas has said 225. The vial back to normal currency has said 200. Uh, Rob has said 55. It's a tricky one, isn't it? Because you don't really know. Um, yeah, you could be very surprised or uh, very, very disappointed. So, yes, not, uh, made it. I like it when it says pre owned, but in good condition. So, they definitely did not wipe down the car with this one, which is uh, kind of cool. All right. So, what, do, hang on, and William, oh, you're lucky you got that winning, William, for 100 bucks. Well done. Um, so, hang on. What, uh, okay. So, 100, hang on. Sorry, James, I missed you. 175 going off the Akira. So you said 175, and your missus has said 115. Daniel, who's joined us, has gone for 40, 40. Chiefs go, Greg King has never let me down. He's added an extra three bucks, and he's gone for five. I think but that's I Greg's, what, Greg's highest estimate ever. I tell you what, if you were to get this, <laughs> that'd be fantastic. 16 bids, and they get the three, five dollars. Absolutely magnificent. All right, vintage Toy Story T-shirt, size large, oh, fanboy size, uh, made in America, da-da-da-da, and still got the tag, and the price went for... 370. Oh, almost the same as the Akira one. What do you reckon? And I think so, straight off the bat, so what Joshua. What we're kind of seeing here is a pattern that if you want a cool vintage t shirt collection, you're going to be dropping um, more than designer t shirts in the shops at the moment. Exactly right. And as I said, Joshua looks like he's got this one at 350 bucks, just adds 20 extra dollars. And away he goes. How good is that? Even Daniel said, wow, not World of Warcraft, but actually, wow, wow. <laughs> and it's a lot of money for a shirt. When it first came out, it would have only been worth a tenth of this price. So you do sort of wonder. And uh, I think if you did buy this and sort of showed your friends, they'd be going, why the hell do you spend that much on it? So some things you think are worth it and other things you go you know what it's just been inflated beyond just being logical so there you go all right we move on to the third item it's something left field from our pop culture sort of realm but uh go for it Aaron. yeah well there's a lot of people that collect music memorabilia and we saw from last uh last time when we talked about record fairs that a lot of pop culture stuff apart from records and music related things can turn up at record fairs now nirvana is one of those um Bands, it rode the grunge wave, really. It was a trendsetter at the time. And they sort of burnt really brightly. And then the lead singer, Kurt Cobain, passed away. And they still got a big following. This is an original t shirt from, I think it's from the Heart Shape Box tour, or at least the release of that um, album. And it's a medium printed in Australia. So it's an Australian um, release, which, you know, we've seen can be quite rare overseas. So you might want to. Think about that when you're having a guess of this one. Well, I tell you what, I think of Nirvana every time I go to a fan club meeting for any club because I just it just smells like nerds. <laughs> 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 All right, so <laughs> teen nerds. All right, so Daniel's gone for 150 on this. Ange, now Ange typically is pretty good at this particular game. He's gone for 2,700 bucks, so that's uh, pretty uh, impressive. So keep your eyes on good old Ange. Uh, Colin's at 400. Joshua's at 425. James has just decided to make his own decision rather than going to the missus. Uh, 1100 for him. William is at 500 and Thomas is at 450 So we'll just wait for more. Now, let me uh, ask you a question, Dags. This is an Acme Australia T-shirt. Acme did all the Batman T-shirts in the 90s, didn't they? Oh, uh, yeah, I think there was quite a lot because, they. I mean, a lot of the print houses all sort of did multiple franchises. So, um, I mean, whatever you think of the name Acme, especially that spelling, it's the Australian Centre for the Moving no, that's Acme, that's with the eye. So Acme, yeah, um, that's the one you think they should be building um, things for the Roadrunner and uh, the Coyote because <laughs> they use Acme yes. all the time. So, um, yeah, so his rockets and his ladders and whatever else. Uh, all right, so where were we? Uh, Ange, Ange has changed his tune, 270. Oh, you put one extra zero when you didn't want to. Rob has gone for 800. Uh, and Hang on. Yeah, okay, Ange, got that. 350 for the vial and 2,000... Uh, worn by oh, was it worn by Kurt? Uh, probably not. And if it was, you could add out about four or five extra zeros, I think, if that was the case. If he had sweat stains under the armpits, I'll tell you what, it would be very, very impressive. All right, Nirvana hard shaped box t shirt made in Australia, of all things. Okay, a little bit left, uh, left field from what we normally get. And the price is 
Look at that, Ange. You should have not have changed your price, but you did. So, you want you what, what if you had that t shirt tucked away in the bottom of a drawer somewhere? You'd really want to rip that out and put it on eBay, wouldn't you? So, Ange had it and then he threw it away. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine uh, what it would have gone for if it was worn, worn by Kurt, Kurt Cobain. I tell you what, because Ange took his price out and dropped it to two seven. No one is close by any stretch. Uh, the closest I think we've got is Rob at eight hundred, and you've still got an no, eight hundred thousand bucks. Isn't James it? a thousand? I, on, over, was there was James. one other that was over a thousand. Oh yes, James. It looks like yeah, James. Uh, you need to cough up an extra thirteen hundred bucks, but the Nirvana shirt could be yours. <laughs> Uh, and <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, uh, yes, I gotta admit, I mean, that's just ridiculous when you sit and think about it. And you're right, oh, if it's autographed by Kurt or whoever, fine, put the price in, but not just as that. Uh, I don't get it, so yeah, I totally agree with you, uh, Thomas. That's just ridiculous. So, um, yes, indeed, very good. So, I don't know what else can be said about that, but uh, yeah, there you go. All right, we move right along to the fourth one. All right, back to Star Wars, something we know and love quite well. Even now, if this, not is, the character. this is all uh, a franchise we all know and love, Star Wars, but Ashoka is probably, I, I would have to say, apart from the Mandalorian, probably the, the, the most popular of the most recent additions to the Star Wars canon. I mean, she's not even recent now. It goes back to the... Uh, the Clone Wars movie, well, that's going back a bit. But when, when I mean recent, I mean not the original trilogy, I guess. Uh, everything after that is recent to me, probably. Uh, so this is Ashoka. She's very, very popular, popular with the guys, popular with the girls, on a T-shirt. It's black. It's cool. How much would you pay? Yeah, I'm looking at the artwork, and it looks like the original Clone Wars version when she was younger rather than the Rebels version when she's older, and it's obviously not the Mandalorian because it's live action. I mean, I find it interesting that it says, I am no Jedi, which is true because she's not, but the way they've written are uh, so – that looks crap. You know, it's like, know. It's, like a, it's like a sneeze is about to come. It's like, ah, Soka. <laughs> it just looks awful. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't know. It's a bit bit tragic. They would have been better off putting her name underneath or something like that. So anyway, so there you go. All right, Ange, uh, where are we? Ange, as it said, 10 bucks, nice and easy. Uh, yeah, don't blame me, Ange, on that one. Um, very, very cool. Colin's gone for 50. Joshua's at 75. Daniel's at 55. James, oh, you're still optimistic at 250. Uh, Rob has said 25. William has said 150. Thomas has said 65 and if Greg pops up and says $2 at the garage sale, even I would agree with that because I reckon this is completely <laughs> right. But little kids wouldn't twig the fact that she's not a Jedi. I mean, unless you watch the, watch the Clone Wars, you wouldn't know. She's a Force user, got lightsabers. She must be a Jedi, but of course she's not. So, But li little, little kids aren't going to be putting $500 on eBay, <laughs> are they? No, exactly right. Uh, I've forgotten who the last person was. So I think James said $250. Uh, where are we? Rob was $25. William is at $150. Thomas is at 65. Christy said 200. Uh, Greg, I agree with you. Two bucks open offers. Yeah, I'd go with that. Um, there we go. And uh, the vial has said uh, 45. So there you go. All right. But you never know. These things can surprise you when uh, when they turn up. So how much would you expect to pay for what is effectively a pretty crappy Ahsoka shirt? Now, I don't know how much Ahsoka stuff they've produced. And ironically, in the Clone Wars, when she came out, she was a very unpopular character, good old snips. But uh, uh, as time went on, uh, people realised she wasn't so bad after all. So there you go. All right, so how much do you expect to pay for a So Katano black T-shirt, size medium, and 10 bucks cheap? <laughs> how good is that? So, Ange, so the money. You get one cent back, Ange. Well done. Yeah, so not not as not an expensive T-shirt after all. Ahsoka really is one of those action figures that is shot through the roof and everybody is after, but not so much for the apparel, I guess. Yeah, well, I mean, as we said earlier, I mean, you can make a far better design T-shirt than this one. So there you go. But, Ange, you get one cent back, dude. Uh, yeah, how good is that? So well done, sir. All right, and the lucky last one. This is going to generate a bit of interest. Oh, I just realised I've yeah. cut the top off, so I'm going to fix that because yeah. it's important to read that. So just leave you... Give me a second while you talk about what it is you're going to talk about. Well, this, this is an interesting one. Spankin isn't around today and he collects uh, production used stuff. So he might have been the one to watch to see if this was um, trash or treasure. But this is apparently Dustin Hoffman's actual um, crew shirt from the Hook movie. And it comes with Providence. Um, and I think Dustin is uh, embroidered inside it. And it's a crew shirt, which is 
sometimes I guess at different levels you get different things. So if you're like one of the lighting crew, they give you a manky T-shirt. But if you're one of the uh, stars of the show, they give you a really nice leather blazer jacket um, with all the bells and whistles. So this is the one of one um, Dustin Hoffman's not screen used but production used uh, jacket from a hook. Um, it's interesting because, as you would know, there was, they produced a lot of Hook merchandise when the film came out, and I uh, was going out with a girl who was actually a big Hook collector at the time, and even we thought back then, there's like, this stuff is never going to appreciate in value at all. There's just no demand for it. And uh, funny enough, uh, I love the post of the original teaser post, which was just the Hook, uh, the bright, uh, shiny Hook, which is absolutely awesome. I got a copy of that. And even a T-shirt that I've still got mint in condition, which has actually got the Hook uh, logo on the front and the writing on the back. But, um, yeah, I think from... A marketing and merchandising standpoint what would you mean if hook merchandise came into your store even if it was mint and box do you reckon there's a demand for it there there is we had a lot of um loose hook stuff when we first opened and it all sold straight away so yeah. there is a bit of interest in hook mm, okay very interesting so i just wouldn't have thought there'd be i mean a lot of people don't even remember the movie but anyway we move on all right and just kicked off with a big ten thousand bucks so that's probably the most expensive item we've had so far in this uh in these episodes three thousand five hundred from colin uh joshua said 1750 some big numbers here two thousand five hundred uh, Thomas says what Ange, nah, you can't cheat, Thomas. You've got to actually tell us what you want. You might actually add an extra dollar on and win this. You never, never know. Christy's gone for 1800 The vials at 6000 Just think if we could add all these dollars together, we'd be able to sort of buy our own Aaron's collectible store. Um, 1500 bucks from Rob. Daniel, 20000 bucks. Oh, dude, how about <laughs> that? Uh, how good is that? Uh, yes, it is worn by uh, Dustin. You maybe might have only worn it for one day, but he did wear it by the sounds of it. Uh, nine thousand. So he's got these sweat stains under the arms. Nine thousand five hundred from James. Uh, Thomas is at three thousand. And uh, yeah, I don't think are you, I don't think even Greg King could chuck in two bucks at the garage sale. For this. <laughs> <laughs> That's what do you reckon? Eh? So uh, yes, screen. Oh, oh, sorry, screen worn. Robin uh, Williams. Sorry, I missed the introduction at the start. So who wore this? It's. It's not worn by Robin Williams. When I read the description, it's it's got Dustin um, in, inscribed inside it, and it was worn by Dost, Dustin Hoffman, not on screen at all. Yeah. Um, it, it, when you look at the top, it says Hook, Dustin Hoffman, movie crew, celebrity, wardrobe, and then I think that's what it is, and they've put screen worn and Robin Williams to attract extra people look at the auction. Yeah, I was thinking that too for the search engines and all the rest of it. So, uh, yeah, so it is a Dustin Hoffman jacket, uh, not a Robin Williams one, even though you, when you read that, even I got confused. I thought, hang on, who was it? Let's say both of them wore the same jacket. So there you go. Anyway, well, you so, uh, so uh, yes, yeah, very, very cool. Went on eBay of all things. So how Dustin, why he handballed it off to somebody to sell as anybody's guest? But as you said, he may have had like a couple of dozen of these things, you know, just wore it for one day and, you know, it was in summer and didn't need to wear another one. So you never, never know. Yeah. So there you go. But uh, very, very cool. I uh, came from the personal collections of this. Oh, okay. His personal collection. Oh, there you go. All right, we move on. So what do you reckon this was worth, kids? Was the 20-something thousand bucks correct? Close-ish. What do we got? Well, that's nearly 10,000 Australian. Um, that's 7,250 uh, US. And usually I don't do the US options, but when I was looking through the Australian stuff, I thought this – this item was so interesting, unusual, I'd include a, an overseas one this week. Usually we just stick to the local stuff. But that's still a really unusual item. And being Hook, I, 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 like Dag said, I don't know if it's one of those movies that is as well remembered as um, you would think, but there are a lot of collectors and it, and it attracted a huge bid in the end. So using the Australian dollars, Ange finally got one in after shooting himself in the foot earlier with uh, knocking a zero off. At least he didn't knock a zero off this time. So well done, Ange. Once again, as I said to you, Ange is the dude to watch. He just knows his shit when it comes to buying stuff on eBay. But uh, how impressive is that? Bloody hell. Um, but, yeah, if Robin Williams wasn't in Hook, it probably wouldn't have anywhere near the interest that it would have now, uh, in my personal opinion. So uh, very good stuff. What do you reckon, eh? Not really remembered for Julia Roberts' performance as Tinkerbell. No, yeah, and you can tell all of her shots are all just done by herself because she just seemed to always be on her own, you know, and um, I reckon they just green screened, screened, filmed her in front of a green screen with all these scenes and then just stuck her in and she didn't even meet the rest of the cast. So uh, there you go. Oh, hang on, we got a bit of a – James was closer, was he? Uh, hang on, how is that possible? James, 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 did I – 
James was closer. Uh, what did it go for? Uh, James, 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 James. Uh, I can't find it. I'm trying to give it to you, Ange, and you're knocking it back, son. So, James, James. I can't find it. Oh, okay. James at 9,500. What did the thing go for? I've actually forgotten. So, 7,500. Ah, split it between the two of you. It's just a bit of fun and games. So, there you go. All we'll right. Rip, rip the jacket in half, and they can have half each. Yeah, there you go. So a bit of hook action. It's a very, very exciting. So, all right. So we're going to move on to our feature presentation, which is what? Today, um, we're taking another bit of a retro tour through through our, our youths, and we're going to visit some of the old arcades and time zones and amusement centres that used to exist. But rather than looking at the, uh, the locations, today we're going to be looking at some of our favourite pinball machines and arcade games. Um, and this kind of goes over into those ultimate collectibles where, you know, if you collect consoles or something, it can get quite expensive. But when you start collecting pinball machines, you need, like, um, spare rooms and spare garages and man caves and, um, you know, quite a lot of coin to, to get them. Um, I've got to just uh, interject there. I loved Rob's comment about the jacket. Lots of coin for a little jacket. Dozens of <laughs> short hats. <laughs> <laughs> uh, absolutely love it. Yeah, so we're talking about um, arcades and the machines that were in those places, and we're going to kick this one off. Now, this was a hard one to research, again, because there's not a lot of um, pictures of old um, arcades in Melbourne. There's a lot of forums that talk about them, but no one really back in the day said, oh, I'm going to take some document, uh, some photos and make some documents of old arcades. Now, these are two of the old ones I could find in Melbourne. I don't actually remember either of them. I used to go to arcades and play quite a lot. One's called Flashback, and that was apparently the Village Cinema branded arcades, and there used to be Flashback arcades all over um, Victoria, uh, I guess, before Time Zone moved in and kicked all of the, the sort of village ones out. And the other one there is Invaders, which was downstairs oh, outside of uh, Flinders Street Station, and it's another one that I don't remember. Maybe they were just a little bit older uh, th than uh, when I was going around to arcades and stuff, because I used to go to all the different arcades because the one thing arcades used to do is make sure they had one unique machine that wasn't in any of the other arcades. So uh, you had to go and visit them all to find your favourite games or check out what was the newest one out. Yeah, because there's an age difference between the two of us, I remember Flashback, uh, and I think they closed down in the mid-'80s. So I actually went there. So this this building here was in uh, Swanson Street, right next to uh, Little Collins Street. Uh, and I used to go in there on, on a regular basis uh, for a period of time because I used to play Asteroids, and then I'll discuss Asteroids later. I even had a car crash just out the front where I'm just about here where I actually – Crack the shits over losing a game of asteroids, and I parked my car too close to the car in front. And I uh, it was this is back in the days of metal, um, uh, what do you call it, bumper bars. And my car being a manual lurch forward when I started, and my bumper bar actually jumped over the tow ball of the guy in front of me, and I couldn't get the car off. So it just made you my day. Just completely thought you were still playing Daytona racing, didn't you? <laughs> Yeah, well, that's right. It was a bloody freaking arcade machine that caused the prank. So, uh, yeah, but uh, but yes, I remember Flashback uh, quite well. But uh, it wasn't my place of choice. Um, my place of choice, we will not find references to anywhere, uh, was actually called The Red Place uh, in Russell Street. It was just a red facade. You know, it was just a normal building, just all red paint for whatever reason. And we just called it The Red Place. It had no name or anything. So uh, that was that the didn't place. Even that, come, that didn't even come up in my research. There was a lot of people who remembered different arcades and mm. remembered ones that I used to go to, but I couldn't find any pictures yeah. at all. So we go to some more, I guess, modern pictures that people kind of will remember, which is of you, your, your time zones and your intensities and yep. play time. Um, the yep. one picture I like there down in the bottom corner is all the time zone tickets you could collect. And here's a sad story. For years and years and years, I collected time zone tickets. And then my son inherited them and he collected time zone tickets. And for years and years and years, he collected them. And then time zone went over to reward cards. And we left it a couple of months and took all these tickets tickets in to go and claim something and they said sorry dudes they don't don't count anymore so there was probably literally thousands of dollars worth of rewards that you know we had paid to get these tickets and we ended up not being able to use them <laughs> so yeah, that was exactly. a bit of a yeah exactly right Ange was also at flashback as well it was cool because it was double level that was a bit of a big deal uh joe's mentioned yeah. penny arcade at good old looney park which is uh, now, the cool. Luna Park arcade was amazing because even at the time it used to have sort of more retro um, games than were in a lot of places, and we'll speak about it a little later. That is the only place I ever saw the Empire Strikes Back pinball machine. That was at Luna Park. 
Very cool. Uh, Thomas has mentioned about sudden impact in Frankston, uh, which is actually kind of cool. So everybody's remembering their local penny parlours, but uh, yeah, the, the red joint, which yeah. I found was interesting, it had no name it's at all. It was just a red place. Uh, and uh, Chapel Street uh, was huge in the 80s as well, which is kind of cool. The thing I find interesting about this picture is you've got all these random dudes just standing <laughs> out of the front. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, yes, and this is the day when... Um, or well, like these days, of course, you know, machines cost more to play and all the rest of it, whereas back in our day it was 20 cents for a game and uh, it was a completely different sort of era. But uh, The thing yes. about the time yeah. zone there as well, if you look next to it, there's another arcade. So arcade, arcades were quite big and considering a lot of them were in the city and in, you know, quite expensive locations, they must have made a ton of money and there must have been a lot of demand for it for there to be so many arcades like that popped up everywhere, um, like was um thomas was mentioned down chapel street there was arcades i used to hang out in burke street camberwell there was a couple of big arcades even um when you go to video libraries um you'd have a pinball machine maybe two uprights and a skill tester so they must have been big money makers at the time totally agree and it was all cash too which is the key thing and the vial i'm not going to put it on the <laughs> screen but the vial has made a mention to of a particular game which we're going to discuss a bit later on which is very very cool but of course our primary discussion is about pinball machines and arcades and of course we're going to kick off with pinball machines and these if you remember these are absolute classics <clears throat> So, yeah, we're going to start off just with a general look of what was out there. Now, pinball for a long time were just generic, and then they sort of hit on the idea, you know, they could theme pinball. So I guess they always did theme them, you know, you could get, you know, sci-fi ones or horror ones, but then they actually went after franchises. So you can see here there's Flash Gordon and Playboy and Kiss, Creature from the Black Lagoon mm -hmm. and Robocop. And the great thing about pinball, a lot of, and, and we see this more today, um, movies and I guess when they do a toy line or when a TV series is big, they send out a press kit and generally the press kit will have all the digital um, advertising they can use. So all the authorised pictures, all of the uh, sort of colours they want to use and be branded with. Pinball machines were fantastic because usually they completely have original art. And by that, I mean, they do take pictures and, you know, use pictures that are publicity steals, but they haven't been given by the uh, movie company a set of guidelines and say, you have to use this art. It all has to fit in with the sort of the, all, all the other merchandise. So the trans lights, which are the top um, board of the pinball machine that are lit up by lights from behind, often have this amazing pinball art. And so this is what we're showing in the first couple of slides here some of the really nice trans lights. Some people who can't afford pinball machines actually collect trans lights and they use mm. them sort of with a mirrored back in their bar or they just use them framed as a yeah. piece of art on their wall. And they go for quite a lot of money, especially some of the rarer vintage ones because um, pinball machines were very disposable and, I mean, they were expensive but they were used up and they'd get damaged really fast and they often didn't get repaired. It was cheaper, you know, they were earning so much money. Mm -hmm. The new pinball and the new generation of pinball would come in. So the old ones would get shunted to the back of the arcade. They'd be the ones that the balls got stuck or some of the mm -hmm. rubbers didn't get repaired and you'd complain about. And then they'd go out of the arcade to the back and then they'd eventually get disposed of in auctions or maybe even thrown out. Yeah, if you're a kind of a person who used to live in a city, there used to be a lot of cafes in like Ligon Street and Sydney Road and all the rest of it, and they would also have pinball machines, sometimes just the one machine uh, which would be in there, and you sort of live on that for a long period of time if you're getting your hamburgers and your milkshakes and whatever else. What I found interesting looking at this photo, uh, so the Kiss pinball machine at the top here, um, one time, uh, speaking of the, one of these cafes, a friend and I went in there, and we only had one 20-cent piece, right? And there was two of us, right? So we thought, well, how can we play with, with the two of us? So we thought, well, how about we play, I have the left flipper and he has the right flipper, okay? And as it turned out, it was just like one of those poetry emotion things. I'm on the left, he's on the right. And we ended up getting free game after free game after free game. And we're doing so well. We thought, no, we'll just stick with this system. And we're there like for maybe 50 minutes, an hour or two hours, whatever, just with one flipper each was absolutely fantastic. Um, and also the Kiss Pinball Machine was one of the first machines to have this ridiculously high uh, score bonus. You know, normally you end up in like thousands, tens of thousands and whatever else. I mean, they had like 800,000 bonus, which is just this ridiculous number. It's like, it, and now, of course, they're into the millions. It's like these numbers are just stupid. But I think the Kiss sort of kicked that off. Uh, but I was a big fan of that. And, of course, Flash Gordon over here absolutely loved it. And, of course, that was in the time when they started having talking pinball machines. And this is a question for you, Aaron. What was the world's first talking pinball machine? 
I should know that because I just read off on it, but, but you're here to remind me. So. <laughs> yeah, I actually uh, spoke to a pinball machine collector and even he didn't know this. It was Gorgar was the world's first talking pinball machine, even though you couldn't really understand it. It's like, you're saying what? <laughs> but that it it is one. interesting because to get the speech out of the old machines, it took up a lot of memory. So to begin with, the machines would often only say one thing or a couple of things, and often mm. it was when when you, you lost, it would tell you you've lost kind of thing. But yep. the more technology um, went along, the more you know speech and then digital gameplay and things like that. But we're going to yep. keep... Looking at that Indeed. as we go along, I guess. So we've got this this picture here. You've seen it a few times already. Now take note of the Playboy pinball machine. Now for whatever reason, if you ever looked at the like the back screen, right? You think a beautiful artwork. You got Hugh Hefner with the two girls and all the rest of it. For whatever reason, in the background, in the in the tub, they put this lady in. Did you ever notice that? I never noticed that. Uh, like when you when you pointed that out to me, I I had to laugh. Um, no, I'd never noticed that before. There are different versions of the Playboy boy pinball machine as well there's the adult version where there's no clothes on the girls oh okay that's the one i gotta buy but uh yeah maybe that lady was the den mother or something like that or the cleaning lady but i, I couldn't believe they put that in it was like someone obviously was having a bit of a dig and it got passed so there you go but anyway we move on and here we go with some some other franchise related ones we've got back to the future there which is a more modern one we've got the the classic uh batman 89 lethal weapon 3 the simpsons and demolition man and i think the interesting thing about this is movies could be hits or they could bomb but there would still be like a good pinball machine on some of the movies that didn't do like fantastic. I mean, they didn't do a machine for Lethal Weapon 1 or 2 and then out comes one for Lethal Weapon 3. And Demolition Man might be another movie that you might not think oh, people are lining up to do the merchandising of, but there was a good pinball machine for Demolition Man. So pinball machines also, if you collect something and there's not a lot of merchandise on it, sometimes you'll be surprised that the, the ultimate piece of merchandise is a penny. So, yeah, there's a few um, few interesting machines. There are some machines that were planned and the movies didn't do so well, so they didn't come out. Like there's pictures of the old Kroll machine, um, which I don't think was ever released. And some of the pinball machines, because they are so expensive, if they don't get the pre-orders, they're very limited numbers of them. So some of the pinball machines are very hard to find. And there's no denying, if you're a fan of a certain franchise, you'll go and play the machine because of the franchise. And I've played the Batman machine on a number of occasions, absolutely loved it, but I never played any of the others. But, uh, yeah, um, uh, and actually uh, a guy in America once sent me a photograph. He had the pinball machine for Batman in the 89 version and a, in the arcade version. I didn't even know there was an arcade game of Batman for 1989, but there was, and he had both of them. It was like, oh, dude, very impressive stuff. So from a collectability point of view, and he's just uh, riding a big high. So it, providing you've got space to store these things, as we discussed last week. <clears throat> And of course, if they made the Batman one, they made the, the Batman Forever one, which must be a better machine because it's more modern, but maybe not the, the equal of the movie in popularity. Then we've got the Jurassic Park machine there. The Last Action Hero, that's another example of a movie that didn't really do as well as everyone expected, but they made a great pinball machine. I don't know if anyone remembers that. There was the big crane on it for the end that you could load the balls onto. Then there's the Flintstones machine and the Star Trek Next Generation machine was a really lovely machine and that was the one I, I do remember. They got lots of voices. They got all the original cast and there'd be different missions and you could do different missions with different characters. So great art. Like that was, I think, when pinball machines really hit their stride sort of in the the early 90s into the mid 90s yeah i can tell you a funny story about the star trek pinball machine uh i was actually at Starfest. i think it was 1993 or 1994 and they actually had one and typically whenever i played games i was always on my own and on this one occasion i'm playing the star trek next generation pinball machine and i had a girl watching me right and she just watched the whole time and it was like in the zone and i'll tell you what i'm whacking i'm everywhere i'm getting free games and this and that and even at the end, when it was finally finished, she walked away and said, uh, I'm impressed. And I thought, dude, aren't I the cool man? <laughs> it was a shame she was already attached I, I often, to somebody else. I could have like you know, said, hey, do you want my phone number? We can play ball somewhere else. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I, often, I often thought that uh, one of the things that conventions maybe missed a trick of 
um, you could hire pinball machines and you can still hire yeah. them for parties and stuff. If like Star Walking got some Star Wars ones for a big convention or any of the other ones uh, did them, I think they'd be a hit be because, do you know what, a lot of these conventions, people are socially awkward and, you know, if there's a game in the corner, they can just go over and play. And it's one of those things that people will then come and watch and you can be involved, but you don't have to, you, you know, talk. Um, so it's one of those things that can work at conventions. And I think the one, the conventions I've seen them at, I think, one time there was a Doctor Who pinball machine at a Doctor Who Christmas meeting. It was used for the entire day. There was always someone on it. So they are quite good at parties and, and things like that. Yeah, providing you have the volume turned down because they can be quite noisy. I know there's a lot of comments coming through, and we're going to get to them a bit later on, but even Ange mentioned he played. Imagine, yeah, because he's been a Star Trek fan, you would play Star Trek a lot. And, of course, I played it because I was a Star Trek fan. It was a great machine, good old next generation. Do you actually remember the original Star Trek machine uh, it was all yellow from the mid-70s. Yes. Uh, do you remember? I, mean, I played that in a cafe, of all things, and, uh, yeah, that was uh, a long time ago. Do you remember that one at all? I, I remember even at the airport when you were waiting for planes to come and go, there was a good selection of arcade machines and pinball machines, and I think they probably did well out there because there's nothing else you can do, really, is there? Yeah, exactly right. So there's a few more comments here, but I'm going to get back to them pretty, pretty soon. So this is the one of the big key machines because it was actually made and designed and manufactured here, I believe. So this is the first one we're going to have a, a bit more of a close look at. This is the um, the Empire Strikes Back machine that came out in 1980, 1981, and was Australian made. Um, there's a lot of fans internationally that didn't even know this machine existed, <laughs> and a lot of people said it wasn't licensed. It was just produced, but it was licensed. It was made by a company called Hanken. Um, they only made 350 units, so it was quite a small um, production run. Like I said, I saw one out at Luna Park and I was blown away because before the internet, I didn't know this existed and I'd been in all these different arcades. And then you see this and it's an amazing piece of art. Well, if you went to the Red Place where I used to hang out, not only did they have this one, but they had its sister right next to it. And do you remember what the other machine with almost the same layout made by the same people? Do you remember what that was called? I don't. What one was that? Space Invaders. So it was actually... Okay, it had this... Sorry, Sorry, it had the same bumpers, didn't it, but without Darth Vader on them? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the actual uh, top screen up here was identical to uh, the, the Empire one, but it had a space invader on it like an alien, but it had that mirrory sort of effect. And the key thing was that there was actually a, like a loop thing in the middle of the playboard, so you could actually get the flipper to go, uh, get the ball to go up and down through the thing if you could get it to work. And they had both machines side by side, the Empire one and Space Invaders, and I believe I sucked at the Space Invaders pinball machine. The fact they even made a Space Invaders pinball machine was amazing. But, uh, yeah, same layout as the Empire one. But, uh, yeah, this became highly so clickable. I think even Steve Sansweet in America was desperately trying to get hold of one of these. Well, the, the Empire one here is interesting because I found uh, the picture in the, the bottom corner I thought was like advertising someone had one now for, for sale, strike, strike back and strike it rich. But no, this was actually the original um, flyer to interest uh, arcades in buying it. And it's really interesting in, in that era from the 70s and 80s, they would tell people like how much money the machine would make if you got it into your arcade. Modern ones don't do that. Modern ones are aimed at individual collectors, buy one for your house kind of thing. So back then it was a totally different market. I don't think anyone back then probably even thought about buying a pinball machine for their house or their spare room. Back then it was purely aimed at making money in arcades and if they could get a good franchise, obviously they're going to get more money for it. And something on this one I wanted to show you in the bottom corner, uh, in the bottom middle, Dags, do you see what... Do you see what's coming out of the... Um, Get stuff. It's an AT. <laughs> <laughs> He's talking about down here. You're, freaking, you're a bloody smart ass here. It's an AT All Train Arbor Transport Walker. <laughs> Wise ass. <laughs> yeah. So that was a great machine. And back in the day before they had the technology, they used um, a lot of tricks. They used like Pepper's Ghost, which anyone who's into movies knows, by using um, mirrors at different angles. You can make things appear and disappear. And the arcade machine or the... The pinball machine for Empire Strikes Back had this fantastic effect where when you looked at Darth Vader, he had flames behind his head, but he looked like he was in a corridor that went back forever. And yeah. this is done by using mirrors and glass as a sort of a um, reflecting um, optical illusion. So you can see it in the pictures. The lights seem to go back and back and back, but it's really just the one set of lights. So Yeah, it was very, very really, trippy. Um, and, uh, yeah, with the Space Evaders machine, it was very – that's how you knew it was made by the same company because it had the same effect. And I don't think any other pinball machine sort of did it. 
So, uh, but yeah, Empire was actually, um, uh, yeah, quite famous. And uh, yeah, is who would have thought, as you said at the time, uh, how rare and collectible it would have become. So, very, very and cool. And it is uh, one of the most sought after pinball machines in the world. Um, as as Dag said, I think Steve Steve Sansweet uh, Sans Sans was Sweet. after one. I don't know if he ever got one. Um, I can't but, remember. Yeah, but they he never may. turn up for sale, and I think it would probably set pinball records if one of the nice one turned up and went went on auction. Yeah, and not only that, I mean, of course, getting one in fantastic condition is almost next to impossible. There you go. Now I understand you're going to talk about your favourites. Is that right? So here. Um, it's, there's too many pinball machines to, to go into detail in all of them. So what I just thought, I would go through my top five of the ones I used to um, play when I was um, going around the pinball machine haunts. So at number five comes in the Adams family. And I think this for me was the start of where pinball machines got serious, where we were talking about they had electronic effects, they had electromagnets, they had synthesized um, voices in them. You can look there, either side is the, the flyer for the Adams Family Machine. Um, and they started doing gimmicks in machines. And you used to, when you play pinball, of course, you knock down the targets and you get different rewards. But when they started getting into the more modern pinball, and I'm talking from, I guess, the 90s onwards, because they were computer controlled and they had... Um, they had more technology in them they could now you could now set different missions and you could do different things and this is where the franchises came in really well because you could replay scenes and events from different movies um, by using the pinball and it's really crazy because really pinball is all the same game where you have a couple of flippers and a ball and you hit targets but the atmosphere you can get by having lighting effects and amazing art and then sound effects from the movies and a clever storyline that goes with it can really separate, you know, an average pinball machine from an, to an absolutely amazing pinball machine. Now, the Adams Family was an amazing pinball machine. And the thing you'll find with the best pinball machines is the people who made them love the franchise. So when you're playing them, you can tell this isn't someone who's been told, go away, can, go away make an Adams Family machine, there's someone who's gone, I love the Adams Family, so I'm going to put Cousin It in it. I'm going to put the, the polar bear that ro rug that roars. I'm going to put, like, all these iconic things from the Adams Family beyond what someone who sort of has a general knowledge of the Adams Family would know. And so when you play the machine, you're kind of rewarded by your own knowledge of the franchise. And this is why I think a lot of people have different fond memories of different machines, because... The machines speak to you. And I loved the original Adams Family and I loved the movie and the machine could have sort of distilled the essence of both and was a fantastic mm. playing machine. So that's my number five pick, the Adams Family. Very cool. Even Ange is uh, agreeing with you on that one. And you are right, machines became very interactive as they went along. And I remember um, like when the black hole came out, suddenly there was a second level. There was a level below the main level. I go, oh my God, you've actually got different levels. And then when the haunted house come out, there was a level on top. So it was three levels. <laughs> and then you're right. They've just made them like, it's just more than just whacking a ball around. There's actually something you've got, you actually got to do throughout the whole thing. So, which is, um, yeah, very, very cool. It's almost like the ball is a secondary item now. So there you go. <clears throat> now, number four, um, is The Twilight Zone. And again, The Twilight Zone was one of my favourite um, TV series. And this was kind of around before The Twilight Zone was really available. It was one of those shows I'd seen late at night and seen the movies. Um, and the thing I used to love with The Twilight Zone was the, the translight picture at the top crams as many different references from different Twilight Zone episodes into it as they can. So when you look at that picture... Um, uh, Rod Serling is standing in the doorway uh, of like an old curiosity shop and then everything in that shop is to do with various episodes of the Twilight Zone. So for me, before I even played the game, there was already a game you could play by trying to identify different episodes and, and then you'd look at the actual play field and there was all different things from different episodes and if you'd watch the episodes, you kind of knew how the game was going to go because you knew how those episodes played out. Now, the Adams Family and the Twilight Zone both, both had electromagnets in. The Adams Family, you'd hit the ball and the ball would stop mid-game and it would be caught on a, on a magnet until the magnet was released. The Twilight Zone did the different thing where the 
buttons would stop controlling the flippers and they would start controlling an electromagnet. So in the top right hand corner there, you can see those two spiral things and they were electromagnets. And the more you flipped the flickers, the more powerful they got. So you could spin the ball around on the middle of the play field by using um, the, fl the flipper buttons, which was something at the time that I thought was absolutely amazing. So it was these kind of innovations that kept the games fresh and interesting. Now, the other thing here, which we get into with people who collect pinball machines, the Robbie the Robot in the top left corner isn't an item that came in that pinball machine. There is a whole secondary market where people create additional little items you can stick in your pinball machine. So they make a pin, uh, Stern or Bally or whoever makes them, Data East, make the pinball machine, and then someone goes, that's a fantastic machine, but if it had a Robbie the Robot there, it would be even better machine. And not only do they create little items that can go in, the pinball machine data board where you plug everything in has extra switches in it that aren't used. So people have got smart enough, they can wire it up. So not only does it just sit there, but it might do stuff that's triggered by the... The, um, the pinball machine as you play. So you can have pinball machines and like some people hot up their cars, you can hot up your pinball machine by adding custom um, custom bumpers, custom lights and custom items. See, I can't help but think that uh, if you're going to do an Aaron's Collectibles pinball machine, you'd want to add in a monkey called Spankin'. <laughs> That'd be actually quite good. Um, with the Twilight Zone one, it would have been intriguing if they opted, and of course you wouldn't do this because it's not the, the way you do it with pinballs, but to have it all monochrome have it just in very shades of grey, black and white, because Twilight Zone was always in black and white. And uh, so if you look at some of the colours in the machine, you'd be going, well, how do you know that's actually an accurate representation of the, the colours of the show? So it would have been intriguing to have a black and white pinball machine uh, where everything was just uh, in, that, in that sort of format. It would have been quite different. So very, yeah. very cool. Next one along. Oh, here we go. I reckon you should have bought this. How come you don't have this one in your collection? I did have this one, and then my wife made me sell it because there wasn't enough room. Everyone would probably think this was my number one, but it's actually, uh, it's an amazing machine, but it's my my number three. I really loved the Doctor Who uh, pinball machine. I loved it for the same reason I love the other machines. Whoever made it was a massive Doctor Who fan because it went beyond... Um, mentioning some old episodes, like there's stuff in it you have to be a fan to have made this machine and pack it full of so many different references and so many different pictures from the show. Um, something I haven't mentioned in the previous two machines did have it, sort of in the modern era of machines, you have a screen and sometimes the play transfers from the play field to you're actually playing a video game. And yeah. in the Doctor Who machine, you had to... Um, control the doctor and jump obstacles or duck under obstacles to get back to the TARDIS before the Dalek exterminated you. And, you know, this was a real innovation when they first put them in because, you know, sometimes you'd be playing, playing and playing the machine, but when you break it up into different um, areas and you're doing different things at the same time, it really adds playability to the machine. The Doctor Who pinball machine um, did a thing where the ball launches out the TARDIS and then you can activate a time a uh, time activator, a time expander. You can play with the different doctors and each doctor will have a different mission. All the cast came back and did different voices for the, the machine. And um, it was a really nice looking machine. The one thing I found about the Doctor Who machine is it faded really quick. So a lot of the ones on, on the market have really washed out um, uh, decals on them. And luckily there are people that do stickers to replace all that kind of stuff there's like a, an industry to keep pinball machines up and running and looking looking great so that was the doctor who machine and up on the top uh right again you can see a little dalek that's lit up that's the dalek that's on top of the machine and again they would do this thing with different levels of collectability where they'd release the standard machine and then that's called the pinball topper where then there's extra things on top if you buy the more deluxe machine. And that Dalek, when you activate activate the time expander, it comes to life and shouts exterminate and moves around and stuff. Wasn't on many of the machines though. So that's always a little bonus when you're looking at pinball machines. There's always like uh, different versions of the machine that you can get sort of the deluxe version. Needed to be a crinoid. Um, good old Greg has said number three, blasphemy. So he's uh, you're off his Christmas card list. So there you go. <laughs> 
Uh, and I like this comment from Tom. It's a long comment, but you can actually kickstart a, uh, a pinball machine with a clicker lighter. So <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Thousand and one uses. All right. Well, well, to... that, was a, that was a thing. You could get ignition switches and you could go into time zone and walk along the machines and use the ignition switches and it would either make the machine go mental or give you lives. But eventually time zone actually put alarms on the machines if you did that. Well, if you wanted to know how to get into machines, two cent pieces. Uh, we were notorious for getting uh, two cent pieces. You used to have to flick them in and they would activate a lot of machines. But that's, of course, you don't do that anymore. We move on to number two. <laughs> number two is the um, the Data East Star Wars pinball. Um, this was a fantastic machine. Again, this came when Star Wars still hadn't like really made its second renaissance and taken off as a massive um, juggernaut of um, you know merchandising. So Star Wars had come back and it was kind of big among fans, but it hadn't hit the level of popularity that it had now. And I remember walking into the Pinball Arcade and seeing the Star Wars machine and just falling in love with it and not being able to play it because there was already a queue and there was already all these piles of coins stacked up on it and there was no way I could wait. So I sat and watched for about half an hour, but I didn't get to play it for a couple of days. And this is what I was saying earlier, where different arcades would speed in and try and get the machine the first, because if you had an exclusive machine, there'd be a line of people there wanting to play it, wanting to play the, the latest machine. And if it was a good machine, the line uh, that would, would be either, even longer. And this is, this is one of those where it was a good machine. Um, it's one of those very desirable machines now. And it's probably one of the pinballs that I played the most growing up. And I, I could say I, I mastered that machine. I knew all of the missions, all of the shots, where you had to hit the ball on each of the flippers to activate everything and, and do it. And, and it was a fantastic machine. And the thing about pinball is, I guess it's like all games, the more you play them, the more sp skillful you get out of it. So the more rewarding they are because you do better and better. Um, you were saying you, you played this machine a bit? Yeah, so uh, even Christy said that uh, it was her favourite, held the record of time zone box hill for the most frequent player. Well, guess what? I can outstrip everybody's records out there because, uh, as you said, I too love this absolute machine. It was awesome. Uh, got a lot of playability out of it. And the key thing is, though, Steve Sansweet. We are talking earlier about whether he needs Steve Sansweet. For those who don't know, he's the world's biggest Star Wars collector. has been for a couple of decades now. Uh, he had one of these in his house. So I got to play it, and sure enough, I got my name up there. It's a shame they didn't have four litters. I only had three, but uh, I was actually wrapped. So I got number five, Commander, and that was in his personal collection. So I was actually very, very wrapped to get that. So, And to just for the people out there who thought, well, Dags and Pimble Machines, Star Wars Pimble Machines, you know, it's a bit of an ass, a bit of a fluke. Well, in actual fact, now, and someone's made a reference to a pinball museum, uh, Neil, I'm going to put that message up in a moment. But I also got a high score on a machine, a Star Wars machine in that museum as well. So uh, when it comes to Star Wars pinball machines and the DAGs, mate, they go hand in hand. So uh, there you go. <laughs> there you go, kids. <laughs> the interesting thing about the Star Wars pinball machine, it's not a few machines, but it, it doesn't have the, the spring-loaded release for the ball. It actually has like an X-wing handle with the, uh, the, uh, the firing target on the side. And to launch the ball, you can shoot TIE fighters that are on the electronic mm. display. And I played that for a while before I even realised that's what I was doing when I released the ball. So it's one of yeah. those things where the more you play a machine, the more details you see and the, the better you get at it. Absolutely. And that was a that was a magnificent machine. And it was just great to just look at all the stuff. Um, so, William, you mentioned this earlier. Yes, yeah, the Australian Pimmel Museum is in Nil. I think that's on the Western Highway as you head towards Adelaide. Uh, a whole bunch of us went out there. Oh, a couple of years ago, it took like four hours to drive there. Uh, we turned up, we were the only ones there, and we played all these machines, including that Star Wars one I just showed you a moment ago. Got my name up in lights. Uh, so it's a long, long way to travel, uh, but they've got a lot of classic stuff out there, and it's well worth checking out. Uh, assuming we're talking about Neil, that's the same place. I don't actually know where Neil is. So either that or this, yeah, I think, it would be, I think it would be the same one. It's quite, quite famous for being the pinball machine. Um, all right, so there. everybody out there, what do you reckon number one is for Aaron's favorite pinball machine? Okay, so Doctor Who has been given the How's Your Father. Star Wars is no chop, you know. It's like Twilight Zone. We've had that one. Yeah, yeah. Give the uh, Adams family just quickly. What do you guys think would be his number one? So, um, yeah, are you right, Angie? It was a road trip, and I tell you what, 
four hours getting there was great playing, but when we're coming back, it was getting dark and someone had to go to work. And it was <laughs> so the trip back wasn't as exciting. Um, here we go. The bloke who runs the Neil Museum said to be the most sought after people is the German Kiss one. Yes, because of the SS in the in the writing. So yes, that's quite quite true. So uh, they so had to change. Fun, collectible collectible for Kiss fans and collectible for Nazis. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> Pretty much too. All right, so all right, so Joshua has said Superman eh, error. No, nah, didn't work. Okay, so what does anybody else think? Just before we get to it, what do you reckon Aaron's number one? Don't say it's the other Doctor Who pinball machine because it's definitely not it. What do you reckon Aaron's <laughs> number one pinball machine? His favourite one happens to be. So we got a seven to second delay. Um, okay. Star Trek, it should be, should be Creature. It's not. You're wrong on both of those, so we've already seen those. Uh, I'll give you a clue. We haven't seen it yet in any of the slides. So there you go. No, Thomas, it is not Docky Who, mate. It was number three, mate. <laughs> Docky Who just didn't cut the mustard. Uh, oh, oh, hang on. And so we've got a bit of insider trading here. Uh, here we go. <laughs> Next gen from Daniel. No, Smurf. No, but somebody has got it right. And yes, good on you, Rob. I don't know if Rob had insider trading or knowledge or not, but Indiana Jones, there we go. So this was my favourite pinball machine, and I spent probably thousands of dollars on this machine. I probably should have just bought one. Um, I loved the you Indiana put Jones the machine. One, so your wife can get rid of that one as well. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, I couldn't have any of them really, could I? It's never going to work. But um, I loved this because I loved Indiana Jones and I really loved how the movies trans translated into gameplay where you could pick Raiders of the Lost Ark and try and do the Ark challenge or, or pick like Temple of Dune and, and try and do the Shakara, uh, Shakara Stone. So Shakira? No, that's the Shakira. Singer. I think it's Shakira, uh, yeah. I think, yeah, and I or, or the the Holy Grail. And what I loved about this, the quotes that they picked from the movie was so good uh, for the gameplay as it was going on. Um, I played this so much that I, I busted the machine twice in the arcade. Um, by getting so worked up, I would actually be able to flick the balls off the plane and and bust the things at the side. So you see the plane down in the bottom center. That's um, in the middle of the playing field, I took that out with a ball and, and and totally destroyed it because it's just a little plastic plane. And I got the I got so excited on a multi ball, like I wasn't hitting targets. I was smashing up the machine. Uh, this is another one where you can see um, on the pictures on the right hand side. There's different customs that can be put into it now. They're all in sort of the same position in the game, but the arc that lights up and the the, the Cup of Christ and the German tank, they're all additions you can buy for your machine and customise it if you've got one at home. Um, the other thing I loved about this, it didn't just have Indiana Jones and Marion, it had the other the other voice cast um, doing stuff. The, the artwork is absolutely amazing. Now, I remember this came out just after Last Crusade and... I was on the high because I really loved Last Crusade. And then I remember the adventure, the advert was the, I think it's up there, the adventure continues. And it was in the arcades that the Indiana Jones arcade machine is coming. So it was a bit of a exciting thing that it was going to come. And then when it arrived, the gameplay was fantastic. You could you could do the mine, mine cart chase on the... Um, of the electronics. The great one I used to play, they used to do the shell game, but it was the Holy Grail. So they'd have three Holy Grails and they'd all shift around and then you have to pick the one. So you have to watch where the um, watch where the Grail was. And if you pick the wrong one, of course, it has the little animation of the guy dying kind of thing from drinking and you chose, uh, you didn't choose wisely or you chose wisely. Um, <laughs> so that's my favourite uh, pinball machine and I've seen in the comments there's a lot of other ones come up that I did used to play I love Terminator I remember playing Terminator out at Melbourne Airport and yeah. some of the other ones Mortal Kombat and Street Fighter and um, there, there was a whole lot I used to play but they were the ones that I used to that just resonated with me and what I played when I was growing up and I do think they're great pieces of art so even if you don't appreciate pinball you can appreciate the artistry uh, the art artistry that goes into making them they're really fantastic machines and they're really great pieces of art and they are also a fantastic investment because they have doubled and tripled in price in the last couple of years very good. So it was actually Sankara. So we had Shakira. I knew Shakira wasn't right because I thought, she's that's a singer. But, I mean, Temple yes. of Doom wasn't my favourite movie. So, uh, yeah, that's why I was never going to get that one right. Uh, Rob also liked Indiana Jones, uh, which uh, which is really good to see. Um, and there was, yeah, comments about Terminator 2. 
uh, <laughs> cracked his back casing and bent a rail as one does. So there you go. Um, yeah. So and because uh, you could argue because Aaron didn't pick a Doctor Who machine being number one, you could say he chose poorly. <laughs> 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 no, that is absolutely fantastic. Um, just quickly for myself, I've only got a couple of windows to just chuck in here. Just uh, for purely, I don't know if I actually had favourites. The Star Wars and Batman probably my favourites, and I love. There's a lot of machines I loved and, and played, but I was a big fan of Centaur, uh, mainly because Centaur, you could have five balls at once when you played multi-ball, and believe me, they were going absolutely everywhere, right? Uh, and they called the ball balls orbs, which I thought was kind of cool. Uh, so, yeah, when I used to play that on a regular basis, and it, as soon as you got the five balls, mate, it was just like flippers going, balls going everywhere. It was You couldn't even watch as to what was going on. It's just insane. Uh, and the other one that I was a big fan of, just because I thought it was just such a cool uh, atmosphere, was the Dark Knight or the Black Knight. And that actually had Magnus save. So you talk about Twilight Zone where the ball would freeze in space. Um, yeah. This may have actually been the start of it, Magnus save, because Black Knight actually had two sets of buttons and you could actually stop the ball uh, from going down the, the side areas here. Uh, and it was called Magnus save. And it was just, I just thought it was really, really cool. I mean, these are all obviously very old machines, but um, yeah, they were my sort and of favorite. And of course, you used to eat licorice while you played that one. Uh, yeah, exactly right. So there you go. Oh, and just pick it up with the good one. Six million dollar man pinball. Because if you remember, the six million dollar man had the post that used to stick up in the middle, right? So the flippers were actually wider apart, and you had a post that would stick up, which was actually quite, uh, kind of, kind of cool. So yeah, there was definitely some very, very groovy uh, functions. There used to be a pinball machine called Xenon, and instead of the bumpers just bumping normally, whenever they bumped, they would actually go pow. So there'd be a voice that goes pow, pow, and there's a female version. So if the ball is jumping around everywhere, we go pow, 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 pow. <laughs> that was very trippy, I've got to say. So um, there you go. Uh, and Thomas, yeah, they're the ones that he remembers too. So, um, yeah, of course, the prices of these things have gone up dramatically. Like we were discussing last week about the Mandalorian pinball machine. You probably have to, like, sell a kidney to pay for that now versus what they would be worth once upon a time. So uh, here we go. Uh, yes, Thomas, yes. You, you always knew when you hit the glass with the ball because you had this bang and you go boy jesus <laughs> so uh, it used yeah, to be so. there'd be a big bang when you got a um an extra game and sometimes you'd yeah. crack the top of and you go i've got an extra game and oh no i've just busted the machine so so yeah actually yeah that was a very loud noise and of course aaron and i did discuss about the fact that when pinball machines in our era it was 20 cents for five balls then it became 40 cents that's 100 percent cost 100 percent more than your usual and then they went from five balls down to three balls and it was like, what a freaking rip that was. It's like, I think a lot of people gave up pinball machines after that. What do you reckon? But then it went from, and then it went up to a dollar as well. They skipped 60, yes. 70, 80. It just went 20, 40, a dollar and rip mm. and, and five to th three balls. So someone was making a lot of money out of those machines. Very good stuff. But there's a lot of history with pinball machines, and a lot of us played them back in the day, whether it was just casually or on uh, you know, abusing them to bits. But uh, yeah, it's a lot of fun and a lot of money spent uh, at the time as well. Now, it's 10 past nine. We were going to discuss arcade machines. Did you still, and we've got 17 people still watching. Um, do you want to continue on? I think I think we will. The arc. If, if the pinball machines had blown out till 9.30, maybe we would have wound it up. But whenever you went to the arcades to play pinball, there was always the arcade machines as well. And yep. so we've quickly put together a list of some of our favourite arcade machines, and I think they will be machines that everybody remembers. Um, now, Gauntlet was one of those machines. It was quite interesting. You could play up to four people at mm. the same time, and it was one of the few games where you didn't get lives, you got life force, and it slowly went down as you played and you could eat food to revive it and you could get potions and that would revive it. And 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 there was a voice that would narrate all the way through as you were going, and it would be virtually telling you to put money in the machine. It would be saying... Green Elf, your life force is dying. No, Green no, Elf, you you've never, no, life force said, left. And you could... No, hang on. Well, well, you used to say, Green Elf is about to die. <laughs> it was as straight <laughs> as that. And you you could feed more money into the machine and your life force could go up. So, so theoretically, if you wanted to complete the game, you never had to die. You could just sit there with your bag full of cash and just pump money into it and you could get further and further. But you can see down the bottom there where there's all those ghosts around, 
you could get through the dungeons and you could go far. And it was a fun game to play with friends. You could either play really well and all work together or you'd do this thing where someone would get trapped in the top corner and you'd make it so they couldn't move and they would just die and then, you know, they'd probably go home and wouldn't talk to you for a week. But you would get these monster generators and you had to kill the monster generators and there would be thousands of monsters popping out at you and you'd kill each one of them with a with one hit but it was really grinding to get through the dungeons and you know on the um on the previous page where they again have the flyers they're like gauntlet is a phenomenon it's the highest earning game we've ever had so <laughs> you can understand they got this system where hey it doesn't matter people don't have to die they don't have three lives we just let them feed money into this machine and they can they can keep going and you know what i bought right into it i fed money into that machine and got a long way in, in, in into gauntlet um i only ever knew of one machine it was in ligon street uh where i used to go and i never got to play it because people were always on it and i was there one day and it was like because i was uh, relatively young these guys were like uh in their 20s and they'd piled up all these 20 cent pieces on the machine they went and got their coffees and they were going to have a long marathon session. And you are absolutely correct. It is such an ingenious way of ensuring that people kept playing because if you're playing four people and Green Elf is about to die, well, hey, it's not like you want to leave the machine and your mates keep going. You're chucking the more 20s. And these dudes were getting prepared for a long session. So, uh, yeah, but I never got to play it myself, but I thought it was absolutely ingenious. Real good cooperative play. It's fantastic. Yeah. This is another one I think a lot of people will – remember and it was an it was another one um that was sort of you know fighting fantasy with um with elves and warriors and um and all that kind of magic and dungeons and dragons and i thought golden axe was uh ingenious um an ingenious game again it was another one you could put more money into play but it was a little bit easier and, you know, for a while there were games you'd play them and you'd just die, but Golden Axe kind of sucked you in because you didn't die straight away. So by the time you got deeper into the game, you were really invested in it and you didn't want to go back to the start. Golden Axe had uh, really beautiful graphics for the time. It stood out in the arcade. Um, and it was another one of those games where you'd go there and you'd want to have a play and there's a couple of people with piles of um, piles of coins you know, who are going to be playing for the next hour and you have to drop your coins and just sit there while you watch people play all the way through. So well, with that I don't in know mind, if you ever played. Yeah. Sorry, with that in mind, Thomas has said he spent a whole week's wages on, <laughs> on machines like this. <laughs> That's exactly really, what Really, it does about. show if you... If you got a group of people and you played Dungeons and Dragons at home, it might be it might be more expensive outlay to buy your modules and your games and stuff, but it's a lot cheaper in the long run and everyone gets to play uh, kind of thing. Sorry, are you so, going to ask yeah, a question? Some of the... Sorry? You were going to ask a question? Yep. You, you're going to ask a question before I catch off. Oh, did you play Did you play this one at all? No, I don't even recall even seeing it. This may have come out after I sort of left the scene. I was sort of out of the picture by the mid-'80s, uh, early to mid-'80s, so no, it does, I don't remember this at all. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And it is, is – oh, oh here's, here's an interesting question. This is Galaga, my favourite shoot 'em up ever. Does anyone recognise uh, the movie in the yep. – where, where that screen cap is from in the yeah, top left-hand Yeah, that's from uh, last, the last Starfighter by the looks of it. But it's the wrong game. Now. No, no. Does anyone anyone know what that's from? That's a young uh, Matthew Broderick. It must be War Games then. It is. It's War Games. Uh, Galago yeah. was in was in War Games. Now, yeah. in the in the days of Space Invaders, it was pretty simple. You'd get rows and rows of invade uh, invaders from space, and you'd shoot them down, and then they send in their next in reinforcements and shoot them down. Now, I remember when when this came out. The most ingenious thing was the bad guys could capture your starfighter mm. and then you could release it and you'd play with two starfighters and you were a freaking death machine. You would just sit there and you would annihilate for about uh, three levels before you lost one of your um, weapons. It was uh, one of your starfighters. It was like uh, a very addictive game. And they used to have challenge stages where you would, um, the fighters had come down and they wouldn't fire at you it was up to you to destroy as many of them as you could and i would just sit there practicing to try and get like perfect um i think it was was it 40 maybe came down like yeah. every time and you could anticipate 
if you played it enough, the patterns for what the mm. the little bugs were gonna gonna come down at. So you could kind of get further into the game by memorizing the the patterns that were built into the machine. So it was a really really fun game, and that was another game. It was an earlier one. My first experience with Galaga was there was a machine in our fish and chip shop, and I remember going in. It's probably quite a young boy. And not knowing the whole rule of if you're waiting to play, you've got to put your 20 cent down and wait um, with it sitting on the arcade machine. So there was probably some teenagers playing and I sat patiently and waited and waited and waited while we were waiting for our fish and chips to be made. And they finished and died and I said, it's my turn now. And they go, no, look and pointed and they had a whole pile of 20 cent pieces. So I patiently waited to have a game and I didn't even get to play because the fish and chips got made and we had to go home. So I was not a happy camper over that. After that, I knew to go in and dump my coins wherever I wanted to play. So I'd be the next person, next person up. The only problem with Galaga was the fact that if you're playing two people, one person could lose all their guys before the other dude even had a shot because of the dual dude scenario, right? You get one camera, one dude, he gets the second guy next to him, he loses a guy, then later on he gets to capture another guy and release it. So you, conceivably you could actually lose, like player one could be out and player two hasn't even started yet. That was any downside that I found. And I also found it was interesting that it was all like in competition with uh, Galaxian. So it was almost yes. like Galaxian and Galaga, both start with G, sound very, very similar with each other. Um, but Gauntlet, I think they roughly came out Golden the same. Axe, Galaga, all you have to do is invent a game with G, and it's one of my favourites. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. So there you go. Speaking of favourites, we're back at this. Rampage. Rampage was another um, innovative game at the time where you could play multiplayer, but usually you were trying to save people and you were trying to, like, stop mm. the invaders. In Rampage, you were trying to create as much havoc and destruction as you could. And this was one of the first games I remember being linked to big screens in arcades. So people would be playing Rampage in the arcade, but their game was also linked to the big screen because people found it so compelling, um, these monsters going in and destroying the city and eating people and bashing up tanks and stamping on cars. Um, it was a fantastic game. You really got to, you know, unleash your inner monster because you got to do the things you, you'd always love to do, you know, pull city blocks down and get, like, more points for the more destruction you could create. And I loved that all the monsters had backstories, um, you know, of how they were created. And in Rampage, I think most people who played it will remember, when you got defeated, you didn't die you mutated back into a normal person. Um, so if you lost all your power, you didn't you didn't end up dead. You just like shrunk back down to a normal human and uh, and you got taken away by the army. I think you sort of shuffled off the side of the screen naked because you didn't have any, <laughs> any clothes. So very very cool. And and so there no, you can see the Rampage Sorry, is so endearing that they've made a, a current movie out of it a couple of years ago. They've also made toys. And I, I came across these, which I didn't know uh, they had done. It was like Stretch, you know, Stretch Armstrong. They'd made yep. Stretch Rampage monsters of Lizzie and Ralph and George um, until I was researching this, this topic. I didn't even know they were made. So they, I thought they were pretty cool. That's my one toy plug uh, for this um this episode kind of thing. And, and, yes, and you can't buy these at Parents Collectibles just yet. Sorry, I did mention that, uh, yes, Ange thought that Rampage was actually quite It wasn't good, too so. bad. For, for games based, uh, movies based on games are usually notoriously bad, but Rampage was actually a lot of fun. Very good. All right. Now, this one I do remember, and I remember its sequel that came out as well, the other machine. Well, this is actually my favourite arcade machine. If I was going to get an arcade machine for the shop or the house, uh, this would probably be it, the original Dragon's Lair. And I think this is probably the machine that I pumped the most money into and progressed the least uh, because it seemed yeah. to just be so hard. Now, I remember Dragon's Lair, there was a big buzz about Dragon's Lair when it came out because at the time everything kind of looked like Space Invaders and... Uh, asteroids, and then this game came out where you were actually playing an animation and what you did controlled the person on screen. And it was all because of, I guess, um, Laserdisc technology. They worked out that the response time in Laserdiscs and changing from track to track, they got fast enough that you could use your joystick to navigate through different um, scenes on a Laserdisc. So you weren't really playing a game. You were just choosing different um, chapters on a laser disc to play. Now, it looks fantastic. It still is an amazing 
looking game. It was animated by uh, Don Booth, who has done a lot of classic animation, and it has a lot of influence by other sort of heavy metal um, magazine artists as well. Um, Princess Daphne, who you had to save in Dragon's Lair, was probably the sexiest um, video game princess. I mean, if there was a, if there was a, a, a you know, a, a list of the, the sexiest one, she's got to be up there. I never even saw her in the game because I couldn't, pro I couldn't progress that far. So that's uh, interesting. As I was saying, sorry. Sorry, that's interesting because I had a mate of mine who was fantastic at playing games and he just, he said, all you need to know is know when to move at what point and you just learn and you just memorise it. And he actually conquered it, it quite those, quickly. Yes. If you memorised it, you could you could go through and do it all. But the thing is, it was another one of those things where at the time I wasn't old enough to have a lot of money. So you go and play two games a week and come back and you've forgotten it. And the other thing that was really annoying, there used to be a flash on the screen of where you would um, try to go. It would like flash. But they did this thing where they would go, here's where you're meant to go. Oh, no, whoops, here, down here. So they would actually you'd have to memorise which flashes were the right direction as well. And so I would pump money and money and money into that. And it was another one of those games. It was upstairs in Time Zone in Burke Street. And when they got the machine, there was a queue probably for six months. There was always a queue on that machine. And it's, an and again, an amazing piece of furniture and it's an amazing piece of art. Yeah, I remember when it first came out, I was actually in uh, tons of fun, for those who remember that, in Russell Street. And it was like, oh, you're right. It was like, geez, you can actually play a cartoon. And uh, you know, once you realise what moves you had to make, um, it was relatively straightforward. Now, of course, you were younger than, say, I was when it first came out. Uh, and I was going to ask the question, do you remember the second game that they produced using exactly the same technology, but the vials already beat me to it? And, of course, it was uh, Space Ace. So, um, Well, they did, they did Dragon's Lair 2 Time Warp, and then they did Space Ace. So, oh, okay. I just remember, I don't remember the second Dragon's Lair, I just remember Space Ace because it was almost um, maybe Dragon Lair, no, the second Dragon's Lair came out. They all else. looked fantastic. I think the, the trouble with whenever the technology like this happens, the first one comes out and then there's a whole heap of copycats that aren't as good. Yeah. And that kind of when the second one comes out, not as many people are interested because, you know, there's been sort of a whole lot of other ones on the market. So, yeah, that's just when I was playing pinballs, they were the arcade machines I was playing in between playing pinballs. So that's like the the arcade from 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 my um, my growing up. Very cool. I've got a couple I want to chuck in uh, for myself. Asteroids was the machine that I mastered. I didn't play it. I mastered it. I actually clocked it back to zero on a couple of occasions, one occasion at least. Uh, and this is the one I actually played a lot of in um, uh, flashback. Uh, and I remember this one occasion because once you got to pass 999,000, you went back to zero, right? And I got officially 142,000, right? So I got it back to zero. And at the end, I was there for like maybe two hours or something. And by the time I'd finished, I looked around and I was in the whole place by myself. So I couldn't actually celebrate my victory with anyone. It was just me. And I was like, oh, get stuff. Um, and on another occasion, I got up to 60,000 on the first dude. So I had all these spaceships lined up at the top because every 10,000, you got a new new spaceship. And I thought, mate, I'm going to cook it tonight. I'm going to be up to like 200,000, 300,000. Absolutely fantastic. <laughs> and what do you reckon? I got so excited. I lost them all by the time I got to 99,000. So it was game over <laughs> for me. But um, I was, a, yeah, I was a master of asteroids. Absolutely loved it. And I spent a lot of time on this. And I found it very satisfying that if you could put in 20 cents and be there for an hour playing one game, that was grouse. But if it was a game you'd never played before, you put in your 20 cents and you're knocked out within the first two or three minutes, you'd be wondering, why would you even bother? So, uh, but you yeah, could be, you could be a victim of your own success. I noticed as I got better at games, my friends didn't like to come to the arcade with me because they'd like run out of money and I'd mm. still be, you know, playing and playing on my first couple of coins and they'd be, oh, we want to go, we want to go. And you're yeah. like, I don't want to give up the game. The coolest thing I used to do, though, um, You'd be playing and you'd be playing and you'd get really far into a game and you had to go. So there'd always be a couple of kids standing around watching and you'd go, yeah. hey, kid, do you want to take over? And <laughs> their faces would just, you know, explode, like, because that was like was something really cool to get that far into a game. They probably died straight away, but I used to do that. to. Sort what are you of doing? What are you talking about? You game. deliberately get yourself killed so it'll finish. You don't handball off free, <laughs> free games. <laughs> then. What do you do for Christmas? Um, so I was a master at Asteroids, but I wasn't very good at Asteroids Deluxe. So when they did Asteroids, it's deluxe they the actual rocks turned uh which i yeah. thought was interesting um and there was like a shield around the ship as well but uh yeah good old asteroids absolutely loved it now speaking of machines that i loved but i absolutely sucked at was battle zone 
right? I love the idea of tanks and all the rest of it, and I sucked terribly. When I played this on the PlayStation, when you had an emulator, I was actually a lot better. But in the in the place, because it actually had the two um, controllers, the two hand controllers, and you had the little um, visor to look through. But uh, I was shit out at this, but geez, I absolutely loved it. And of course, using all these vector graphic type things, it looks as cheap as chips, but at the time was actually um, really cutting edge. So I've got to say that uh, this is one that I wish I could have mastered, but uh, I wasn't very, very flash at. Uh, and now here's a question. Do you know what this is? No, I was going to say Defender, but it's not, is it? No. When this came out, now we're talking about the Red Place earlier in Russell Street, right? Now, when the Red Place got a new machine, they wouldn't get one. they get like four, like a dozen of these things, right? So when Donkey Kong came out, they had a dozen of those. And when Pac-Man came out, which was originally called Ghost Muncher, um, there was a dozen of those. And they had a dozen of these as well. And, the, and there's two of them, and I'll keep it in a sec. So, yep, the Vile's got it. So it was called Scramble. And no, not scrambler, just scramble. Okay, there's no R at the end. And I was a huge fan of this. Absolutely loved it and enjoyed it. I spent a lot of time playing this. You got to go through the buildings and all the places and blow shit up and get your fuel and all the rest of it. So Rob's got it as well. So um, a huge, but a lot of people don't remember it. It sort of just came and went and uh, and disappeared. But uh, I got to say, myself personally, I was a huge fan. But they made a second one. Does anybody know what this is called? So uh, I don't expect, if you didn't know the first one, you probably wouldn't know the second one, but uh, we'll wait for the audience to see if they know who's who in the zoo. It was like a version of Scramble, but it was a lot harder, and you had a helicopter instead was of the ship. Was it called Heli something with the helicopter? or No, no, uh, no. no. Uh, so I'll just see if anybody comes up with this. But this was a lot harder, and i got to say I didn't enjoy this one as much. But the advantage of this is that if you got to the end and you're about to die, you could put more money in and keep going. And, of course, back in our days uh, when we were using the two-cent pieces, we could actually flick. We actually flicked in like 40 or 50 of them because we wanted to get to the end. So, all right. Uh, no, he's not called Choplifter and not called Chopper Command. So both of you are both wrong. Uh, and because uh, we were desperate to get to the end of this thing, and eventually we did because, as I said, my mate was a master of playing these games. Uh, the name of the game was uh, Super Cobra. So uh, there you go. But it's based on this, on the idea of um, uh, Scramble, which was a very, very cool. And just finally, uh, not even a, a sit-down game. It was actually uh, a car racing game. So I was a big fan of Sega Rally. Uh, and, of course, I uh, in working at Toyota, I always picked the Toyota Celica, and I did actually finish this on a couple of occasions. But I thought in terms of sit-down rally games, I was a big fan of Sega Rally. Uh, there was both sit-down versions and stand-up versions, if I recall, but mainly the sit-down ones. And uh, but I never got to play against other people. I was always playing against the uh, the AI, uh, which was uh, kind of groovy. But uh, there you go. But uh, yeah, there's a whole range of them. Um, Cobra Command. No, I didn't know what Cobra Command was. So, uh, but yeah, that's sort of my um, uh, selection. So, and so of course, that's our, our brief brief look on games. I think yep. there's a lot we didn't touch on. We haven't. No. I deliberately didn't look at any Star Wars games or um, some of the other games because I think we'll come back and have a whole episode on retro gaming and look at, uh, at more more depth of it. That was more just the the ones Dags and I grew up playing yeah. with. So thanks thanks for watching. And uh, well, I before we go, we've, it's right on 9.30. We can squeeze this in. It'll only take five minutes. Do you want to <laughs> see Aaron's pick of the week? Now, believe it or not, this is worth – no, don't hang on. Don't, don't, don't leave us yet. It's, it's all good. Very, very cool. Uh, so I'm a Delta fan. Okay. Like Delta Goodrum. Okay. So – all right, so you got to see Aaron's pick of the week. This is an absolute classic. No, Rob, don't leave us yet, mate. you got to stick around, son. Stick around. All right, so here we go. Aaron's pick of the week. Let's get into it. What do you reckon of ladies, kids? <laughs> so this came into the shop this week. I... I didn't know I didn't know this item existed, but once you know it exists, it's the it's the car accessory that you have to have. Um, it's it's already Spankin's like favorite go to item in the shop. Um, he's been having a lot of fun with it. Does anyone know what this actually is? Uh, probably, if you if you're reading what's on it, you you've probably got a clue. Yeah, if someone yes, says you a, get a grip, uh, you can interpret that in many different ways. But this handle will definitely help you. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Good on you, so Dave. Dave's got it. It's not a chick roll holder, dude. It's a chick. <laughs> you don't put women in it. You put a chick roll in it. <laughs> uh, so, oh, yes, so this Luke's lost hand for men. <laughs> 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 oh, I love it. 
Yes, so it, it could be a, a lot of different things, but it's actually a Chico roll holder. And if you you can hold your Chico roll and put it into your drinks holder in the car, so you can you, you don't just have a, a drinks holder. You can turn it into a, a doesn't have to hold your Chico roll. It could probably hold anything that's long and tubular, and you'd like to um, whack into it really. So what? So for people watching this overseas, just very quickly, what's a Chico roll? It's it's like a it's like a mystery roll, really, isn't it? No one knows exactly what's inside a Chico roll. I guess it's it's kind of like a spring roll. Uh, it's got some meat and it's got some cabbage and it's got some mystery stuff in there. And um, it's usually, you know, been sitting in the heater at a fish and chip shop for about five hours before it sells. But that's when it hits its maximum taste um, delicacy, really, isn't it? So, uh, so for those people who, who are from overseas, no idea what we're talking about. It was a, a something you could eat. It was shaped like like cylindrical, um, and the way it was promoted, <laughs> very good. The way it was promoted, it really actually did feature the hot motorcycles with the hot girl holding a Chico roll very suggestively. And there was actually a commercial where, because it came in a, 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 a paper bag, and the woman would actually smack it and would actually just come out the top. <laughs> I tell you what, it was, it was, it was from the 80s, 70s, 80s, uh, and you look at that hand that Aaron's holding and you can think of a thousand different things that that could be used for. But this is a family show, so Chico rolls are the way to go, eh? And, uh, yes, and it does work well with spanking. Spanking Chico roll holders, we, it's just that we're heading in towards some, some very dodgy territory right here, so there you go. So um, there is spanking in his bone with the Chico yeah, roll yeah, holder. Oh, yeah, he's holding the bone. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we everyone. thought we'd actually sort of uh yeah finish the night on a bit of a laugh but uh yeah an actual chico roll holder for your car how unbelievable is that isn't that insane absolutely insane so there you go um any further thoughts on the old chico roll holder there uh mr aaron i don't know it's so good i don't know if i can sell it i think um i think spankin is going to probably live in it on the uh front counter for a while before we let it go yeah, it's funny, as you're right, Dave, was promoted with hot hot women. And you think by today's standards, that's like a completely sexist as you could possibly get. But that's just how things were back then. And uh, nobody knew any different. It's the way it goes. So there you go. And look at that. We're right on five. Uh, so any final words before we head off? Thanks for sticking with us. Hope everyone enjoyed the show tonight. Um, anyone wants to come and discuss it in store tomorrow, I'll be around all day. And Dags is here on Saturdays. Yeah, so turn up tomorrow to talk to Aaron about the show. I won't be there, so you'll probably be encouraged to turn up tomorrow. So how good is that? And as always, may all your collectibles remain mint in box. Or oh, rip them off the card.